what we did this year. Last year we spoke in Birmingham, where we gave a talk uh, about Camelot in general. Uh, this year we'll be speaking about the new future. So, um, I'm Jürgen Dietz. This is my colleague, uh, Eric Janssens. This is uh, our data. Um, I'm going to skip further introduction. Please refer to these links. Our project uses Python and Qt and SQL Alchemy as a, the main building blocks. Uh, maybe a uh, quick show of hands uh, who uses Qt, who uses SpyQt, who uses SpySide. Okay, cool. Um, the main website, Python Cloud, with hyphen. And uh, the mailing list can be found on Google Groups. So let's kick off. What is Camelot? Here you can see, well, first of all, Camelot is a framework. It's a framework to develop rich GUI applications, and uh, the speed of development is uh, kind of crucial, as well as um, the ease of use for uh, the, the end users in the other order. So we uh, we really uh, want to give the end user a good experience. That's what it is. This is how it looks like to define an object, an entity. And as you can see, it's inspired by Django uh, to define the fields in a simple way. Um, here you can see a movie entity which has a title, a short description, a release date, and a genre. And they are all fields where you specify what type they are, unicode, date, and so on. Every entity uh, has to have an admin class uh, where you can specify at least, as you can see here, what needs to be displayed in the list. That's basically uh, the, the core of the project. Um, this is what it looks like in Linux. So here you have a um, navigation <laughs> thing. You have a toolbar. You have tabs. We'll talk about that later. And you uh, get a list with uh, filters, actions. We'll talk about all these. And here you can see the columns that we saw in the code. Cover time, release date, ready. Uh, and if you click on a row, you get the object itself. We'll see that later on. So, um, an important question is, of course, why should one use Camelot? First of all, because it's user and developer friendly. We really spend a lot of time uh, looking at users, how they are using the application and then improving upon it so that uh, it's intuitive for the user to use. And developer friendly, because Camelot is a framework, but we try to make it a framework that you can customize without the need to monkey patch. So it it's exists out of a set of base classes, and you can always subclass one of those classes, re-implement some of its methods to customize the behavior, and then inject this class back into your application. So you can customize things without, you know, without using the keyframes. It's based on, on Qt and SQL Alchemy, which are both uh, very mature libraries. So with Qt, you can develop cross-platform applications, uh, which are very, very nice to use. And SQL Alchemy is without doubt, it's the, the best program for, for Python that you can get. It has a lot of very advanced features, and, and this is very useful if you start a small application but once your application grows, you will need more advanced features, and those are all in SQL Alchemy. So that's, that's very good to know if you start developing an application. It's also a very productive environment to develop applications in. If you have an ID for a database application, it, you can go very fast from just from ID to, to implementation. That's because it's based on, on um, the Django admin interface, how Django works. So that's also very productive, so we, we took a lot of ideas from it uh, that we reused in Camelot. 
and the application is not threaded from the start. Now, why is this important? In, in Camelot, we have a GUI thread, which runs basically all the QT stuff, and we have a model thread, which runs all the SQL optimy stuff. And this means if, if you have a query that is, and that is a little bit slow, or there is a network connection that is slow, or a, a file is opening slow, or it's a very large file, your application will never freeze. So there is always a first level of security against freezing of applications because of this separation of the model in one thread and the GUI in the other thread. Um, and Camelot was developed from day one with multi-threading in mind. So as you all know, it's, it's very difficult to implement multi-threading in, in an application that was not designed this way. I don't believe Eric's word uh, on how, uh, on how, why you should use Camelot. Here are some quotes, mainly from uh, the mailing list, because that's one of our main uh, communication channels. Mr. Jay Foley says Camelot is proven to be a great software development environment. This quote is not new, so is proving to be, I think, maybe it's uh, already proved. Um, Jens on the mailing list, we uh, couldn't find his last name. Maybe Jens here? Uh, but we, we wanted to put it in here because, you know, it's just fun to use. If, if a user, if, if someone uses your software and says it's fun to use, you know, it makes it, uh, that's, that's fun. It's nice to hear. Enjoyment, yeah. Um, looks really promising. And Mr. Kaiser says, I'm already able to build desktop applications at warp speed, just as promised. So, um, let's, so with this introductory, uh, we can start the talk. Let's just uh, say what we're going to talk about. Um, we split this talk up into big parts. Uh, new features and lessons learned. This is one is uh, at the back, not uh, it's the smallest uh, um, part. The new features are, as you can see, tap-based desktop display queries, table view, dynamic field attributes, actions with options, and map plot integration. And then at the end, we'll talk about uh, what we learned this year. Um, we had a lot of deployments. We had a lot of uh, we had a couple of uh, successful. The commercial applications on top of Camelot, which, uh, well, we'll discuss uh, what we learned from that and how it affected our development model and how we uh, 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 sharpened our tool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. First up, that based desktop. We used to have uh, an application with separate windows. Uh, we looked at the users and they didn't get it. So we switched to tabs. Uh, every browser these days has it, so it's intuitive. Users, uh, they know what a snap of the thing. So, um, let's see it work. Look, this is a uh, uh, Mac. This runs in a Mac. Uh, we had Linux screenshots, we have uh, Windows movies in this presentation. It's all real. So let's see what happens. So you see, we have a home tab. It's always there. We can't close it because it can contain actions, application actions. Here, you see, it's, a, it's to create a new movie. Opens up a new window, you have a form to create a new movie. Not going to do anything here. Uh, you can open another tab, like the movie list. You can see, I have two tabs. The home tab is always there. And the movie tab is also consultable. If you right click, you can open a tab in a new window. Uh, in, uh, you can open uh, a list in a new tab, sorry. And you can easily switch between them. You can close the tab. And if you double click on a tab, it maximizes. Note, because this is um, on Mac, 
We still have the, the main menu file edit view help. On Windows, this disappears. Um, so you get maximum view. Okay, so one of the new features of Camelot is the ability to display query results. So um, until last year, you could easily display and edit uh, tables in a database. But now you can also define queries and then display and edit those. So how does that work? Suppose we have a, a very simple model here. We have uh, movies. And a movie has a, a director, which is a person. So there's a link between movie and person. And then we have visitor reports, which is uh, the number of visitors that went to look at a movie on a specific day. So we have a relation between visitor report and movies. Now suppose we want to, um, to show to the user how many visitors went to a movie of a certain director without doing this in some kind of report, but directly into the movie. So this is how, how it looks like in code. We have a person with two fields, a first name and a last name, a movie with a director, which refers to the person, and then we have a visitor report, which refers to the movie, and has a field visitors with yeah, the number of visitors. So to display um, the result that we want in, uh, in Camelot, we first need an object, because Camelot works on objects that are mapped through SQL Alchemy. So we just define a visitors per director object with a, a little admin interface to, to tell it which fields we want to display in the list. But we don't define fields in here because there's actually no, no table behind, behind these objects. So um, all the attributes of this, of this object will be put there by SQL Alchemy. We just tell it to display those attributes in the list. So how do we proceed then? First we create a select statement in SQL Alchemy. So we say select, and then we say which fields we want in our select statement. That's from, from line four to line seven. So we take the person, uh, the primary key of person, which is party ID. We take his first name, his last name. We take the sum of all the visitors. And then we specify the where clause on line nine where we say you want the persons that are associated with the movie as a director, and we take the visitor reports which are associated with the movie. And then we group this, uh, this result set by the person fields, because we want to group everything um, by director. Notice that we don't have to specify from which tables you're selecting. That's something SQL Alchemy will, will do for you. Um, and then we map this, this, uh, this select statement that's in line 18. We map this select statement to our visitors per director object. Um, you can see that you don't need to specify the primary key SQL Alchemy has to use for uh, mapping this, this result set to the object because it will, SQL Alchemy will be smart enough to take the person party ID for it. If, if your uh, select statements are more difficult, or you have compound primary keys, then it might be needed to specify those. And we also tell it to always refresh uh, its mapping. This means that every time the, the query will be executed, SQL Alchemy will update the values, the attribute values of the mapped object. Okay, that's all we have to do. And we put this in the, in the, in the user interface and you get this nice uh, result, this nice table that you can use. So, the slide about table views, also a movie. Uh, just to demonstrate, we have frozen columns. Column one here, the color column. It uh, stays frozen while you can scroll the other uh, columns. Just uh, something new we would uh, like to show you how easy it is to specify this in the admin. This, frozen, this column's frozen and specify the amount of uh, the number of columns you want to freeze. So dynamic field attributes. Uh, what are field attributes in Camelot? Uh, field attributes are, uh, they specify how Camel should render a certain field uh, in, the, in the graphical user interface. 
So for each field, you can specify a number of attributes, uh, like minimum or maximum or precision, which is the numbers behind the decimal point, or you can specify the suffix. Now, all those attributes, they can be static, like you say, for example, the suffix is always m for meter, but those field attributes can also be dynamic. This means you can, you can use a function as a field attribute, and then Camelot will evaluate this function for each object, and will um, change the field attributes according to the result of this function. Now, until last year, this only worked for like two field attributes, like tooltip and background call. But as of uh, as of the last release, this works for most of the of the field attributes. So, um, in this example, we'll demonstrate a financial product. A financial product is something like a, can be a savings account. So we made a, a financial product called a Python investment. And a financial product can have certain features like interest rate, it can have an, an entry fee, a minimum number of days uh, your money needs to be in the savings account. And we'll, we'll just show you how easy it is with those dynamic field attributes to make a very simple data structure to define very complex uh, products. So this is a list of all the features of a certain financial product. And then we'll, we'll, you see that each feature has a different suffix a different precision, and it can have a different background color as well. So here is uh, the form of one of those features. And you see the, um, this is the, the drop down box with the feature. And if you change the feature, you see that the value, the, um, the suffix of the value changes as well as its, uh, its precision. And its background can change as well depending on, on the value you entered. For example, if you entered values that are probably bogus, like uh, interest rates that are, that are too high, if you're not living in Greece, this is probably not true. So, how do we implement such thing? First of all, uh, we define an enumeration of features. So the, the area line one until three, we have this enumeration where one, two, and three will be the values that are stored in the database. And then the user will see interest rate, tax rate, or entry fee. Then we define a feature class where we can have many features for one product. Um, and a feature has a name, which, which is uh, what's uh, specified in the enumeration. And it can have a value, which is an enumeric field. So, how to introduce the dynamic field attributes? We, we extend the feature table a little bit, so we add for each feature a specific suffix. And then we create a function on line 8, value suffix, which gives the suffix that should be used for a certain feature, depending on, on the name of the feature. And then in line 18, we tell Camelot to use this value suffix function as the field attribute for suffix for the value field. And then every time the, uh, the name of the feature changes, they will to evaluate this function and change the suffix of the value. And to make this uh, more complex, we can add, for example, a threshold at uh, the last column of our features table. And this will define when, when a feature becomes probably invalid. And then we create a value background color function which will return the background color of the value depending on, on the value itself. Um, so notice that there is this uh, color scheme class. This color scheme class contains all the colors of the Tango color team. So if you use colors from this class, you're certain that they, uh, they map well to the, uh, to the interface. And then again, in the field attributes, we say the background color of the value can be get from the value payment or function. And this way you can you can very easily create uh, something to configure complex products. And also if you have if you need new features for a product, you just add in one line in the table and you're done. So for example in, in this uh, in this application we have more than 20 features and every month users ask new features and it just 
a new bit of work for us to, to have on the Another area where we uh, did a lot of work this year is actions. Quick overview. Actions can have uh, a different context. They can work on lists, forms, and the entire application. And you can, uh, uh, the act, uh, and um, actions can run in the model or in the GUI thread. An example of this is the docx form action, which we uh, use a lot. And the clients uh, really appreciate this. Uh, it's a way to uh, generate Word XML and open them directly in Word. So the client can have a nice report, uh, which he can uh, later edit uh, if he wants. So here's this in action. You have the action buttons there, one of which is account state. If I click it, a Word document opens, which can be reouted by somebody else. <laughs> and uh, you can see it's still Word, so user can, uh, can uh, always edit it. If the template uh, uh, fixable or you can uh, change it? Yes. And uh, the style of the document? No, 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 this is just custom. You make whatever. You take, actually, you take a Word document, you create a Word document in Word, you save it as a built XML file, and then you, you run it through XML lint, you clean it a bit, and then you create your template from it. But you are going to explain it. Yes. So let's see how it works. So you create uh, an object which uh, extends docx form action available in Camelot, and you uh, create a context. The context here contains the uh, variables uh, or the placeholders um, where you assign the values to. So we have here today, which has a date. Uh, account is an object subscriber. It's going to be a list. Uh, correspondent can be a list too. Um, you specify a get template uh, method, which just gets uh, the XML file, uh, which you probably got from your client. And uh, you load up the environment, uh, which speaks for itself, I think. Um, you can use any environment. We mostly use Jinja. Quick sample of, of how the XML looks like, a Word XML file uh, where you can uh, place the placeholder which will get uh, uh, filled in. Here we use Jinja, like I said. Uh, we use the Today uh, label and we uh, run it through a Jinja filter date to nicely uh, format it. Another very cool feature uh, which uh, a lot of clients love is uh, the document merger, which is in Camelot for free. Um, you make a document like, uh, like uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, here I made a small document with uh, some placeholders and I use the OBG, OBJ uh, object. Um, to get the, the specific fields uh, from the object. Uh, we have title, uh, we have director, uh, and so on. Of course, the little magic needs to be done with this in our link to, uh, to get Word to play nice with these, uh, these tags. Uh, let's see, an action, I think. Yes, like I said, we use these placeholders, these uh, ginger placeholders here. We'll start from that. Um, here I open up the, the movies list. I select three movies. Go to edit, merge document, and select the uh, XML file that I just showed you. And three documents are generated because I selected three movies. 
each movie, each document will not contain the information about this, the movie. So you see everything is uh, nicely replaced. To show you one of cheating. This is the, the other movie, the second movie, Casino Royale. And finally, third movie, Toy Story. Document merge, your clients will love it. Then we have um, another example, which are list actions with, with options. So list actions are actions that um, appear on the, on the right hand corner of the table view. There's a button, you can click on it, and um, something happens, like in this case, uh, generating a report. You see when, when you click on it, the, uh, the action asks uh, some information from the user. For example, here the user has to say if he wants on his report only the selected uh, rows in the table view or all the rows. And that changes the behavior of the, of the action. So I will now uh, quickly demonstrate how to build those actions. So um, Generating a report is something that happens inside the model thread because you need access to the database. So you just subclass a uh, class named list action from model function. That's, that's the base class in Camelot. And it has an important method, method which is model run. It has three arguments. Collection, that's all the rows in the table view the, the user is looking at. Selection is an iterator over uh, over all the um, selected rows, and then there's the third argument options, which we'll discuss uh, privately. So to create your own action, you just subclass list action from model function, implement the model run method. In this simple case, we just print all the objects in the selection, and then add an instance of the my list action object to the list actions of the, the admin. That's it. Then the action is now there. And now we'll demonstrate how to use options uh, before running the actions. So what you then have to do is to specify a, an inner class, options, of the action class. When Camelot sees this option class, it will pop up a form uh, in front of the user if, when he presses the button. And it will ask the user to complete this form and then continue with the action. So this demonstrates as well the, the possibility of Camelot to, to work with uh, objects that are not mapped to the database. So this is just a plain old Python object. It has uh, one attribute only selected. And we, we give it an, an admin class to tell Camelot how to display this object. And then in the model run method, the third argument options will be an instance of the, of the options here, with a capital class. Uh, with the values entered by the user, and then you can use these options inside the, the, the run method to either, in this case, print the objects that were selected or print all the objects. So that's a, it's a very, it's a quite common pattern uh, in this kind of applications to have just this options dialog, and it's, it's very fast uh, to create it this way. Next, we have Matplotlib integration. Um, this is a multi okay. So how does that work? Um, Matplotlib works with a set of plot commands. Um, and those plot commands are executed on access objects. Access objects are access uh, in, a, in, a, in a chart. And the way Camelot works, because we have two threads, we have the model thread and the GUI thread. In the model thread, we have to aggregate all the data we want to, we want to put on the plot. And then in the, in the GUI thread, we'll make the actual plot really fast, so that uh, there is no slowdown for the user. So how does it work? How does it work? In the model thread, we are going to record all plot commands to Matplotlib. So we created a fake Matplotlib access object. You call all commands on this access object, they are recorded, and then they are shipped. They are recorded and stored in what we call a container, 
this container is shipped to the GUI thread, and in the GUI thread, we just execute those commands with all the data already fetched, so that goes really fast. So that that's, sounds more complicated than it is. This is an example of it, to display um, a chart on, the, on the, a form. We just have to create an app property, in this case a chart, which returns uh, a container that contains all the commands from our problem. And then in the field attributes you say this property chart needs to be displayed with a chart delegate and then this, this just acts as a normal uh, as a normal field type of float or an integer, but in this case a chart. Um, and then inside the chart property we return a plot container. A plot container is a very simple container for my plot. Deck. It takes as its arguments, as its construction arguments, all the arguments you can give to the plotlet plot function. But that's really easy to create simple plots. The first plot you saw was, was created with, uh, with this function. Um, you can create more complex plots as well. Uh, in this plot you have a, a vertical span and there are uh, grid lines. I don't think you can see them, but uh, they are there. Uh, so you see in this uh, chart method, we create an access container object and then we call various functions on this access container. The container stores all the actions, all the functions you called uh, along with the arguments and then you ship the access container to the GUI thread and the <coughs> chart delegate takes care of, of displaying the of the figure. So, how we did in the real world. This uh, concludes the, the new features. Now we'll talk a bit about uh, what we learned last uh, well, the past year in the real world <coughs> by dealing with clients. So that's us, our team, young, happy, you know, vibrant bunch. And this is us after a hundred deployments. So, deploying a uh, deployment for a desktop application uh, is somewhat different than web apps, for example. So, but notice how cool we're still doing. So, how do we do it? So one of the things we did was, uh, what I think we did wrong was we were using a Py to exe to deploy our application. So what we did, we just downloaded a custom uh, stock Python uh, from the website. We uh, downloaded various libraries from the website, installed them, and then used Py to exe to create a bundle of the application, and then prayed that it would work uh, on the site of the customer, which was almost never the case. So what did we do? We created our own Python distribution from source for all the binary libraries we needed. Um, this was a lot of work, but uh, what, we did, what we can do if, if we did this, we have one installer which installs our own Python distribution. It's a distribution that doesn't depend on registry settings, so it does not interfere with already installed Pythons or something else. And then to deploy an application, we just add our little module, the application itself, to the Python distribution. Ship the Python distribution with the right entries in the menu, in the Windows Start menu, and we're done. And all the libraries you use, um, they, just, they just work because you're using them in a Python distribution and not in some changed environment like Python exit, so you don't need to use dirty tricks and all this kind of stuff. We were able to, um, to compile all the libraries with the options that we wanted, like SQL Alchemy, with the C extensions to get more speed up, the same for Jinja. Um, and when there still is a, an issue, we can fire a Python interpreter at the, at the site, or just use the, the spider IDD, which we included, to edit some configuration files. And this all saved us a, a tremendous amount of time in, in deploying. And, and you can get this uh, this Python distribution from the website. Of course, a little bit of Windows test. So.
So we also changed our, our development model a little bit. So in our development model, you had like three parties that were involved. You had the developers, us. You had the domain expert who knew everything about what the application should do. And then you had the users. There were many of them. We don't know them. We're a little bit scared of them. Um, So how do we do our development now? We have the, the domain experts, which give inputs to the developers. The developers modify and create the application. And then we have BuildBot that makes nightly builds. And those nightly builds are through an automatic updating system, immediately installed on the PC of the, of the domain experts, so they can follow really quickly on what we're doing. And, they, and so we have a, a very good feedback loop. Then, when, um, when both domain experts and developers think okay, the application is at a state that it can be released, the release is pushed through the automatic update system to the PC of the users. And the PCs of the users, they give logs back to us for a logging database so we can see if there are exceptions happening at the site of the users and we can fix uh, the application before the user has noticed something went wrong. To accomplish this, we had we uh, built uh, or Eric uh, built a small tool. It's called Cloud Launch. It's a uh, it's a terminal tool. Uh, it's, it doesn't have a GUI, and it's tightly uh, integrated with uh, setup tools. So you can see here, uh, we can build an egg with Vegas Cloud, and we can build a Windows installer with uh, Winnings Cloud. Pretty straightforward and easy. The egg, the egg is a little bit special in the sense that it contains metadata about the application on how to update itself. Well, the egg does it. <laughs> it's a different file. It's a cloud file, CLD file we use uh, to uh, store a dictionary. Uh, well, it's a it's a JSON object uh, which contains all the information about uh, this update. Uh, revision numbers, we use revision numbers to see if a client needs an update. Uh, every time it starts the application, it goes to see uh, whether uh, uh, you can find a cloud file and then check with his own file and then uh, it'll download uh, the egg. The application restarts, the new egg is loaded and update is done. Works very well. Uh, the other nice feature is that we can monitor our clients. So you can see here in the second uh, command, we use set up a pie on the cloud, and we get nice info about what the users are doing and how it's uh, how it's failing. So that's it. That was our talk about new features and uh, what we learned this year. Can kind of again our data? Um, maybe. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, there is a course plan on SQL Alchemy and Camelot in Germany, which uh, will be taught by Eric. Um, it's in somewhere in October. Data is on the website. Yes. Please consult uh, the Camelot.com for uh, for more information about that. And uh, I will put the slides online soon. Uh, I mean today. So thank you very much, and if there are any questions, please. So, um, actually, the image application I've been able to print something, which is almost identical to what you guys have done. It's not quite as general or as complete as yours, but it's the same basic idea. Um, I was wondering if you've already got a big SQL model and it's all set up all nicely, and I say I wanted to use one of your fancy table keys, 
can I, can I use your product as a, as a library and say, use it with this SQL object, displaying this beautiful widget? Or if, if you have SQL alchemy objects, then, you, then it can be done, yes. Right. If, if you're just uh, a relational database and you're using, uh, like, uh, you can use SQL alchemy to, to extract uh, objects from it, I don't know, I don't think that that would be the purpose of the application. But if you have a SQL alchemy set of objects, then you can. Just a question about licensing. How do you handle the YQT TPL license or on, on the on Google clients mostly, especially uh, as de deployment? Uh, well, we, we have uh, the Camelot itself is GPL, yeah. like quite cute, yeah. and we have a commercial quite cute license. Yeah. So, then, because any, so you, you don't have any look at my side, for example, thinking about fishing for that? Well, models, um, but when we decide between PyQt or PySite, if it's really a decision, we will decide on, on technical merits of, of both frameworks. Um, that being said, there is a script inside the source distribution which converts Camelot to PySite. Um, it was not really working properly with, with PySite 1.0 because there were still some bugs in PySite, but I, I believe they have been fixed, but I didn't try it, uh, it afterwards. The distribution is a, is a it's a Python script, of course, and it downloads all the um, all the sources from the various websites and builds it all in one step. So, um, if you want to upgrade the library, it's just uh, updating the download location for the source sites. And that's it. There was one, one blog on the internet uh, from, from uh, I don't remember the name of the person who wrote it, um, but he, he saw it as a replacement to, to Microsoft Access. We never really really started with, with that idea in mind, but it appears that um, yeah, we can replace Microsoft Access applications with Capold, but we see Capold as something different from Access because the development model is, is completely di different. It's not drag and drop, it's, it's writing code and, and using the full power of Python to, uh, to generate your stuff. Do you support the localization? Excuse me? Do you support the localization? Yes, 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 of course. Yes. Yeah, we demonstrated this last year. There is even the option if you if you have if you're running a Camelot application and there is a field name, the user can right click on the field name and change the translation himself. So that that's really handy if, if you're deploying to, to multiple languages. And then you can ask a user to translate the application and extract the PO file from it and ship it to the next thing. Zero on top. It's very simple. It's like like the Django or uh, system 
but it's it's really a, something completely different. I don't see it as only as, a, as an ORM, or as a, you, you don't have to see it as a tool to write SQL queries in Python, because you, you could have written SQL as well. I, I more see it as a tool to manipulate queries, and, and just a different perspective. But I'm very happy with uh, Okay, thank you.